Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 28, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the upcoming spring revenue forecast and why we think the administration should release it sooner rather than later. Second, we explain the opportunities the withdrawal from Russia of BP, other oil and gas companies and resource companies in general may create for Alaska. And third, we discuss our growing frustration with legislative finance and the Alaska media over their lack of transparency about more equitable and lower impact alternatives to PFD cuts. And now, let's join Michael. Let's dive into it and talk this morning about, uh, of course, uh, uh, all the things. Uh, the weekly top three are the top three things that you think people should be paying attention to. Uh, and a lot of times you slip things in there that we may not have noticed from before. Uh, the spring forecast, the impact and timing of the spring forecast is where we're going to start, which is good because I'd lost track of it because of uh, everything that was going on. So uh, let's talk. Let's start there and uh, feel free to share whatever you need to. Spring forecast uh, and, and the spring forecast is an update of the uh, uh, fall revenue forecast. The spring forecast is an adjustment for uh, uh, an update on prices and an update on volumes. And uh, sometimes a spring forecast isn't a big deal. Uh, but this year, I think it's going to be a big deal. And frankly, um, I think the fact that it's sort of looming over the legislature explains in part why the Senate finance in particular is trying to move ahead of uh, the, uh, the PFD debate. Uh, they've been using numbers from the fall revenue forecast uh, that frankly are lower, uh, significantly lower than the numbers that we're gonna see in the spring forecast. And, and to some degree, I think they're trying to get that debate done and get the perceptions in the mind of people fixed uh, while they've still got uh, from their perspective, the lower uh, fall forecast numbers in front of them. So I'm going to try uh, a little bit of, of magic this morning by doing a screen sharing. If it doesn't work, tell me. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to try to explain what we're going to see here. Um, in let's see, share. There we go. Hopefully that does it. Do you see it? Do you see a chart in we, front of you, Michael? We got the chart right in front of us. All right. So this chart is is my effort at showing. Um, uh, what the spring revenue forecast is going to tell us. The solid lines uh, represent uh, the break-even price. That is the price uh, that uh, oil would need to be to balance the budget uh, under various scenarios. Uh, the top uh, light blue line is what the oil price would need to be not to have to balance the budget without having any draw uh, from uh, the permanent fund. The red line is the oil price necessary to uh, balance the budget at a statutory PFD. The maroon solid line uh, toward the bottom uh, starts at the $70 price level is the, uh, the oil price, what the oil price would need to be to balance the budget at POMB 5050, which is what, uh, what the governor's proposed. Overlaid on that, I put two dotted or dashed lines. The top dash line, the dark dash line, is what the oil price is currently and project and projected by the futures market to be um, over the 10-year period. 
And the green line, the green dash line on the bottom is the oil price projected uh, uh, in the fall revenue forecast. You can see uh, that there's a huge gap, significant gap between the green line, uh, particularly in 2023, 2024, uh, and 2025, there's a huge gap between the green line, uh, the break even, uh, what, what, the, what the, the fall revenue forecast says, uh, projects the price to be, and the, and the black dashed line, which is what the current futures market uh, tells us uh, the projected price is to be. And right. the way that Department of Revenue has been doing the forecasts uh, is they've been relying on the futures market, as I, as I think they should, and as I've suggested in the past that they should. Um, and so when you see the, 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 the spring revenue forecast, you're going to see projected prices that are, that are along the lines of the black dash line as opposed to, um, as opposed to the green line. The, the Senate finance has been using the dashed green line in all of their analyses to this point. And, 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 Brad, and you, Brad, just, just yep. br- sort it out for us here for those on the radio that can't see the chart. Give us some of these numbers so that we know kind of where what we're talking about when we're talking about these two converging lines. The lowest of the line is the green one, and that's uh, that's running low. And it just just kind of describe it for folks on the radio who can't see the chart as well. Sure, sure. Thanks for reminding me. So the 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 low green line, the fall revenue forecast has a price of seventy one dollars in twenty twenty three, sixty nine dollars in twenty twenty four, sixty eight dollars in twenty twenty five, and extends out to sixty seven dollars. Uh, in 2030, the black dash line, which is the the current futures market, has uh, a, a price of $87, some $16 higher than the fall revenue forecast in 2023, $81, some $12 higher than the uh, fall revenue forecast in 2024, and $77, some $9 higher than the fall revenue forecast in 2025. So you've got you've got some huge price movements. Uh, that are going on between the fall revenue forecast and what is likely to be in the spring forecast. Right. What the, what the Senate has been doing, what Senate finance has been doing has been using the green dash line, the fall revenue forecast in all of their analyses. And you can see that the, that the green dash line, the fall revenue forecast falls significantly below, not only uh, the statutory P uh, the statutory PFD, which is the red line that runs from, $87 uh, uh, to 86 to 87 to 88 uh, on ultimately down to 83 by 2030. The green line falls not only substantially below the statutory PFD, it also falls below POMB 5050, what the break-even price would be with uh, with POMB 50. Right. Uh, POMB 50, the break-even price is 71 uh, in 2023, 74 compared to the green line of, of 69. 74 and 25 compared to the green line of 68 um, and on out. So what Senate finance has been able to show by using the green line, by using the fall revenue forecast, is that we're still in, quote, deficit, uh, even uh, even at POMB 5050, based upon the, the prices in the fall revenue forecast. When the spring revenue forecast comes in, uh, all, of a sudden, all of a sudden that whole debate is going to change because the spring revenue forecast shows prices substantially above, projected prices substantially above, uh, uh, certainly POMB 5050 indeed uh, shows at least for 2023 that the budget would balance at, the, at a statutory PFD uh, for, with, the, uh, with the projected price for uh, 2023. The projected price falls below the break-even price for the statutory PFD beginning in 2024 and running all the way out to 2030. Uh, so there's still deficits at the statutory PFD, but it shows surpluses. Um, uh, the, 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 the projected price, the spring revenue forecast price, uh, will show surpluses compared to POMB 5050 in 2023, 2024, 2025, 2026, 2027. We'll show finally the, the uh, projected price hitting POMB 5050. That is that is a break even at POMB 5050 in 2028, and slight deficits slight deficits in 2029 and 2030. So the debate's going to change once the spring revenue forecast um, uh, uh, is published. I'm going right. to try to stop sharing. Come back live here. Sure. As possible. And when is it expected? As you're working on that, when is it expected that uh, the uh, 
uh, that the spring revenue forecast should hit the streets here? So the spring forecast is usually due in um, uh, uh, by March. Well, is is statutorily due, I think, by March fifteenth. Sometimes the administration delays it. A couple of years ago, it was they didn't publish it until April. There's nothing that prevents them from publishing it early. And if it were me, if I were the one, you know, d- doing political strategy, which for the administration, fortunately, I'm not. But if I were the one doing it, I would publish it early because it's going to change the nature of the debate um, uh, about uh, the PFD substantially uh, uh, from being, as I say, a deficit compared to uh, uh, the fall POMV 50-50, the governor's proposal being a deficit compared to the fall revenue forecast to being a surplus uh, compared to what should be uh, the spring revenue forecast. And from the administration's standpoint, the sooner that they can get that debate shifted to the spring revenue forecast, it's going to be the better for them, right? Uh, because they're going to uh, uh, they're going to have uh, the ability to show uh, that they're surpluses. So I think there's something more going on here in Senate finance. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I think there's something more going on here with Senate finance in terms of trying to accelerate the PFD debate than simply oh we want to get it out of the way before we you know before we get to the budget. I think they're trying to take advantage of the of the fall re- of the of the substantial difference between the fall revenue forecast and what I think we're going to see uh, in the spring revenue forecast. Right, because it backs up their argument. That's why they're going full court press right now on all this because it backs up their argument. The minute that those other forecasts come out, somebody could say, "Well, whoa, 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 wait a second. You shouldn't be going after this much of a PFD take or a PFD draw because here's what they're projecting now." In in essence. And so that's why they're trying to go full court press on this now. Yeah, Bert has been has has sort of laid the groundwork to object to the spring revenue forecast. He has accused the administration of changing the numbers every month and of and of you know rolling out uh, sort of a, a constant rolling of of new numbers. I expect that when the spring revenue forecast comes out, that Senate Finance at least is going to try to downplay it. Uh, and still go back to the fall the fall forecast numbers. We're going to hear Natasha talking about, uh, you know, the con the 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 that oil prices go up, oil prices go down, and you can't ever count on oil prices. I mean, they're going to try to discount uh, the spring forecast, but it is the spring forecast, and the budget ultimately is supposed to be based uh, on the spring forecast. So I think the spring revenue forecast is going to change the nature of the debate, and the sooner the administration gets it out there, I think the better off we're going to be. All right, well, let's uh, quickly uh, here get a quick tease on number two for the day, and this is the effect of the Ukrainian war on uh, oil and gas, and what does it mean for us? And so give us a quick tease on this. So clearly, the Ukrainian war has has an effect on oil, is having an effect on oil price, and clearly that's one of the effects on the price. But I think there are a couple of other significant effects uh, of the uh, of the Ukrainian war that that people aren't thinking through yet, uh, or or are just beginning to think through that I that uh, that we need to focus on, and I want to talk about that. Welcome back to the program. We're continuing now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We just talked about the timing and the impact of the spring revenue forecast, and now we're going to talk about uh, you know, of course, the oil prices. But what else does the Ukrainian war mean to Alaska in terms of oil investment, LNG? minerals and all that let's get the hot take here from brad keithley on number two of the weekly top three brad there were some shocking developments over the weekend uh out of europe um from an oil perspective there was none more shocking than bp uh saying that it was going to abandon its investment in rosneft uh one of the uh, uh lead uh soviet or russian um, uh, oil companies. Um, BP held a 19%, 20% stake uh, in Rosneft. It was it, it, it consolidated what that translated into in terms of oil reserves and natural gas reserves uh, onto BP's books. It was a big part of, uh, of BP's global uh, energy picture. And as a result of, of <laughs> two things, uh, one, the invasion, but secondly, uh, the the withdrawal of Europe 
from essentially financial recognition of the Soviet Union, of, of Russia, uh, uh, BP uh, made the decision uh, extremely quickly, made the decision to uh, withdraw from Rosneft. They're going to try to sell their interest, uh, but they're essentially taking an impairment on their books, saying that, you know, if we can't sell it, uh, this is what uh, this is what it's going to mean uh, mean to our books. Um, that was shortly followed by Equinor, uh, the Norwegian oil company, uh, formerly known as Statoil, uh, doing the same thing with respect to its investments um, in uh, uh, in Russia, and was was shortly followed after that by Shell, uh, doing the same thing. I mean, all eyes are now sort of turning to Total, which has. Uh, the French oil company, which has the next largest set of investments in Exxon, which has investments in uh, in Russia as well, whether they're going to withdraw also. But what what's really happening is is Russia is becoming so isolated that that people, the oil companies, um, uh, gas companies, don't want to be investing and looking to Russia uh, for. Uh, That creates huge. Uh, that creates a huge hole in the remainder of the world. It essentially takes out Russia as a major player in oil and gas uh, uh, resources, and creates a huge hole uh, in the in the remainder of the world in terms of where are where are replacement resources going to come from. And as a result of creating that huge hole, creates a huge opportunity uh, for uh, for other uh, resource rich regions. I think to attract investment. That they otherwise were not, because that investment was going uh, ultimately, uh, ultimately to Russia. Right. I think Alaska. I think Alaska has the potential to be one of the big beneficiaries of that, not only on the oil and gas side, and in, in in terms of additional investment in our oil regions, uh, increased profile for the for the Alaska LNG project. I don't know if it pushes it over the edge, but it certainly gives it an increased profile, um, as well as our mineral mineral resources. And, and 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 this sort of takes me back to the early 1970s. Alaska got going as an oil region as a result of the Saudi oil embargo of the early 1970s. Alaska and the UK. Right. We knew there was we knew there was oil in both of those regions, but there hadn't been the rush of investment to the to develop those regions uh, until the Saudi oil embargo. All of a sudden, that created a huge hole uh, in oil and gas resources globally. And and push people out to make investments in areas they hadn't otherwise uh, done. I think Russia. I think the withdrawal of BP, Shell, uh, uh, Equinor, uh, and the potential withdrawal of others, or if not it, the isolation of others for 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 failing to withdraw, I think that creates an, a, a hole that looks a lot like the 1973 oil embargo that resulted in uh, in Alaska. Uh, and the North Sea becoming uh, uh, major opportunities for uh, major regions for uh, for investment, and and so I we we need to be thinking about this much more broadly than than the impact on oil price, the impact of uh, the the immediate impact on oil price of of what's going on with uh, Russia and U Ukraine. We need to look at this as a huge opportunity, I think, uh, to push Alaska investment forward. I I, I think the <clears throat> the value of Pika Pika just just escalated. Um, ex exponentially uh, as, a, as, a, as an oil opportunity. Probably the interest in Conoco's Willow project, when Conoco's had a quarter in, uh, 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 an offer of a quarter interest in its, its, in its entire North Slope properties, I think interest in that probably just escalated. So I, I think there's an opportunity here that we ought to view as, as, as a, a big opportunity separate and apart from what's going on with, with immediate oil prices. Right. And, of course, we remember also the nationalization of the uh, oil and gas fields down in Venezuela. Now, not obviously as big a player as Russia, but that also had at the same time spiked some of the long-term interest in Alaska because, again, these oil companies are looking for places that are geopolitically stable. They don't want to invest in a company that's the potential for some totalitarian thug to come in and nationalize or take over or – do what's going on in Russia, you know, agitate their neighbors and become isolated. So it's the same kind of thing where all of a sudden the places that are the most geopolitically stable become the most attractive investment opportunities for the future, especially when they're trying to think yeah. long term and in, in terms of decades. Yeah. And, you know, and Russia was considered geopolitically stable. I mean, because you had you had a 
totalitarian regime, but it was considered stable because of that. Right. And now all of a sudden it's, it's just gone. So, you know, BP, BP, I cannot, I cannot overstate the significance in the oil world of BP abandoning uh, the Rosneft investment. That's, that's just huge. And, you know, and for Equinor to follow and Shell to follow, th 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 those are significant for those companies as well. But those are just huge uh, uh, developments. And, and I, think, I think Alaska needs to think long term in terms of what opportunities that, that opens up for us. Well, and hopefully it gives us, again, the opportunity to, uh, you know, not make missteps and to gain some of that investment and maybe make back some of the ground that's been lost over the whole uh, carbon offset, Green New Deal, all the other problems that we've been facing. So hopefully that uh, moves forward um, in, in a good light. I don't know if you want to comment on the whole Gazprom thing, but, you know, I, I in my mind as I watch this go out, and again, I am not a political analyst on European affairs, but even as a layman, I kind of looked at this and realized with the amount of gas that uh, is being provided to Western Europe by Russia and Gazprom, um, I realized that this probably made Putin feel a lot more comfortable doing what he did, realizing that he kind of holds him hostage to the short hairs with that oil or uh, with the uh, natural gas that's going in there. I mean, am I am I wrong there? You you probably know those numbers a lot better than I do. That's a that's a pretty pretty heavy bet to think that somehow Western Europe would be okay with Russia shutting off their gas supply. Well, it's certainly been an issue. It's actually been building as an issue. Uh, Russia has been reducing deliveries uh, into uh, Europe, uh, natural gas or pipeline gas deliveries into Europe uh, in the entire winter. There was a point uh, early in the winter when uh, Europe was draining its storage uh, at a time well before it should be because the Russian gas wasn't being delivered. Um, and, and Europe started scrambling. We started diverting LNG price, started diverting LNG tankers from their normal runs to Asia, uh, to Europe, and Europe started uh, uh, refilling storage, uh, frankly, from, uh, from LNG. Um, so it's, not, it, it, it's something that Europe was sort of prepared for. I mean, Russia accounts for 40%. Russian pipe gas accounts for 40% of European supply. So right. it's, it's, not, it's nothing you can ever fully account for. But it's something that Europe was sort of a, it was getting ready for because of the way Russia was dealing with gas uh, uh, early in the season. I don't know if that was part of uh, Putin's startup of, of Ukraine. He was you know, beginning to put pressure on Europe, showing what he could do. But it, it's been amazing. In the last weekend, we've had an entire change uh, in European energy policy. I, you know, historians now are going to be looking back at this, at, at this last weekend is just an amazing time. It, Germany has changed about so many things. I mean, they had a policy of not sending uh, armaments to, uh, uh, to other nations. Uh, they changed that. They've changed their LNG policy. Uh, Germany had shut down effectively two uh, uh, LNG import terminals that have been proposed for Germany. So, no, we're going to be we're going to be fine. We don't need that LNG supply. We're going to have renewables. Now they put them on the on the on the front burner and sort of supercharged those projects. They're talking about uh, Germany had been uh, uh, phasing out its uh, nuclear uh, uh, energy uh, electricity generating capacity. They're talking about extending. Uh, their nukes. Um, so it's a, it, it, it's just been a huge change in Europe. Uh, and that's part of what I'm going to talk about in the next segment. Uh, there's going to be more about that that I'll talk about in the next segment. But it's just been a huge, huge change in, uh, in, in European, uh, Euro the European approach to energy in one weekend. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you're right. I think historians will look back on this last week and say this is probably one of the most impactful weeks in uh, you know in probably the last 75 years as you see the number of policies whether it's energy or uh, you know militarism or anything else that have changed at the drop of a hat and like i said earlier i think putin expected that when he applied pressure to the pressure points he he expected to see things like nato shatter and instead even to the surprise of some of the more you know some of the western talking heads they were like, no, 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 it came together. It came together as a fist. It has strengthened NATO. It has changed policies in, in nations that haven't made a change since World War II. And now suddenly they're on the other side of that going, nope, I think we're going to do this. It really kind of, it, it has changed the whole playing field. It has. And, and I think historians are going to look back. I mean, 
historians have the perspective of time, so they may look at it much differently. But to me, what's really happened is the Ukrainian president standing firm. If he would have, if he would have done what the Afghani president did, and you know, fled the country, right, and and, and demoralized the country, and had everything fall in the country around it, I'm not sure Europe would have changed. But the fact that the Europe that the, that the Ukrainian president stood firm and said, "No, I'm not leaving." <laughs> in fact, he said at, at, in one conversation uh, uh, with uh, with the European heads of state that uh, that 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 evening conversation might be the last time I'm alive. Um, the fact he stood firm um, and and the country stood firm behind him, uh, I think led Europe to sort of you know it's like cold splash of water in the face. It led Europe to to, to, to decide to back him and as a consequence led to all of these other things that uh, that uh, Europe is uh, is going through now. So yeah. it, it's a it's a sea, sea change in uh, in what we're seeing out of European uh, uh, energy policy. I agree. I think my favorite quote from his him was I don't need a ride, I need more ammo. You know, he's not looking right. to leave. He would send send more send more anti-tank missiles. So um all right, so that finishes up for number 2 which leads us to number 3. Which um, I think I mean I know that you you kind of shared with me yesterday that um, that it's it's something that's that's uh, frustrating you. Um, it doesn't just frustrate me; it infuriates me. Uh, and that is this lying by omission from legislative finance uh, on the fact that they're not giving us the whole picture when they talk about the various options that are available. Uh, for trying to fix some of this fiscal gap that they're talking about. And, of course, that ties back into number one with the actual spring revenue forecast discussion. But the fact is is that they're being disingenuous with the numbers and not showing us a lot of the things that we need to. Give us, uh, give us number three, your frustration with Ledge Finance and what they're not telling us. So Ledge Finance did a presentation, a long presentation last week, uh, to Senate Finance uh, about – uh, the various options. That, the, the, part of that was to use the fall revenue forecast numbers, so they showed deficits even at POMV 5050. But but they had a 31 page presentation that was all about one thing, showing that using the PFD, showing that showing that you could not balance the budget unless you cut the PFD. Now, what's really disingenuous about that is Ledge Finance itself recognized that there are alternatives to cutting. Uh, the PFD, that there are alternative revenue sources uh, cutting the PFD. And in their um, uh, uh, their overview of the governor's budget, which is a document they do annually, uh, this year they said, Ledge Finance stated that, that quote, equity, economic uh, impacts, efficiency, and other considerations should be addressed if the legislature chooses to explore revenue options. Well, PFD cuts are one revenue options, run right. revenue option, but there are others. Uh, other tax options, uh, as well as as spending cut options, and ledge finance did nothing, did no analysis of the impact of any of those other options. The entire 31-page presentation was focused in entirely on justifying PFD cuts, and it was it was intended to drive to one conclusion, and that is you had to make PFD cuts uh, to balance the budget. No analysis of no analysis in 31 pages. No analysis of alternatives, even though they themselves, in their in their overview of the governor's budget, admitted that there were that there are alternatives, and admitted that you needed to take into account equitable considerations, economic impact considerations, uh, and and the and the like. It's not like it's not like there aren't tools to do that. The 2017 uh, uh, ITEP study, the 2016 ICER study, give you those tools. I use them every landmine uh, on Friday. Uh, you can use those tools every day. It's not like those tools aren't there to do the analysis of, of the alternative, uh, of, of the impacts of the alternatives and compare them to PFD cuts, but they're not doing it. Um, and, and by omitting, it's the error of omission, by omitting the alternatives and the consideration of the impact of the alternatives, they're, they're driving, they're driving the, 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 the debate in the legislature and they're driving the media, who isn't doing a very good job of talking about those alternatives either. Right. They're driving the media to the to the irrevocable conclusion that you have to do PFD cuts and only PFD cuts in order to balance the budget. It's just it it is disingenuous 
uh, of ledge finance. It's likely the result of the instructions that are being given from the chairman of the finance committees, but it's, it's disingenuous to the, it's doing the legislature a disservice by not giving them alternatives. It's doing the media a disservice by not giving them the alternatives. It's doing Alaskans a disservice by not giving them the alternatives. So we can have a debate about what the best alternative is. Right, exactly. And that's the kind of most irritating thing. They don't do the analysis. They don't do the impactual analysis on uh, the economy or the families. They don't talk about that either in this report uh, for the uh, taking of the PFD. Not only do they ignore other alternative revenues or reductions that could happen, they refuse to address what the overall impact of the Alaska economy and Alaska families are, which you did in your chart on the landmine, which is uh, there, there's a lot of good stuff out there for folks to go see. But it is definitely one of those things that just drives me absolutely batty to look at this and see that they're basically, again, lying through omission. This is the resurrection of David Teal, Kevin says in the chat room. I think that's a probably a, a an accurate uh, take on this. I had to laugh at that. It was Kevin McCabe that said, that this is the uh, resurrection of David Teal. I mean, this is kind of Teal esque in its uh, in its uh, in its uh, I guess simplicity, but also its elegance of basically omitting all this stuff and then looking at you with a straight face and said, "We're just giving you the facts," kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it really it bothers me. I mean, part of what triggers this is Andrew Ketchman from from Alaska Public Media did an article, and he keeps referring to uh, ledge finance as nonpartisan. In, in, in sort of giving them the imprimatur of, of you know, the, the know, knowing all, seeing all uh, body that can, you know, is really not trying to come at it with a taint, uh, just trying to give you the facts. Well, they're not giving us the facts. They're not giving us all of the facts. They're not giving us all of the relevant facts. And, and, and to sort of, you know, paint them in that, in that light of you know the 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 supreme nonpartisan right observer. non-biased non-biased they sit yeah. back they just observe and report right now now before i dump on alexi painter who's the who's the head of ledge finance too much this is probably driven by by bert and natasha um and by uh, and on the house side by kelly merrick um, and uh, uh, and Representative Foster. I mean, it's probably driven by the chairs of the finance committee to whom Alexei reports, and they're telling him what he's going to tell them. But then you, you can't say that you can't say that ledge finance is nonpartisan. They're hugely partisan because they're being told what to say. They're being told, you know, it, it's it, it's sort of the it's the ultimate circle, right? I want you to tell, Bert says, I want you to tell me this. Alexi says this. Bert says, see, he told me this. I mean, <laughs> we're not, we're not getting unbiased information. We're not getting right. quote, nonpartisan information. We're getting, you know, what Bert wants us to hear, what Bert and Click and Natasha want us to, want us, want us to hear. Alaskans aren't hearing the alternatives. Right. The outcome, what you're looking for is outcome-based research, Right. This is the outcome that I want. Please research it and give it to me. Sure, here it is. I mean, you you sign my paychecks. Okay, whatever you say, that's the outcome you want. I'll I'll give you backing information and ignore everything else and not report anything to the contrary. And 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 to give Alexi credit, maybe this sentence in the overview was Alexi's plea for, hey, I can do this other stuff. You know, I can do the the equity, economic impacts, efficiency, and other considerations, I can do it. Um, uh, sort of his plea of, of, you know, somebody asked me to do it. Uh, but right. then Bert, Natasha, and Click, and, and, and Neil, and Kelly say, no, 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 we don't want any of that. We just want you to give us, you know, the, what, whatever it takes to, to justify PFD cuts is the option. That's the irony is that he mentions it in the, in the original summary of everything and the overview and says, here's what we could do. And then it completely ignores it for the rest of the time. And it's just like, oh, here's the outcome you were looking for. You're right. Maybe it was his way of saying, please, somebody, somebody ask me for the economic impact uh, analysis and the distributional analysis and all the other things. I'll give it to you. And uh, and yet nobody in power wants to do that. This is, again, this is the problem with the powers that be that are in there uh, that want to keep business as usual. And, and the effect of it is they control the media, too, because the media is only reporting what ledge, you know, they're giving ledge finance this exalted status and then reporting what ledge finance says. Bert's controlled what ledge finance says. 
Um, and so all of a sudden, you know, Burt gets triple the, the bang out of his position because he's able to control Ledge Finance, and then Ledge Finance gets the exalted, uh, the exalted status of uh, of the nonpartisan, unbiased right. observer. Well, it's it's uh, it, the media's buying it. The media's part of the problem on this too. Right. Well, I mean, where's the investigative journalism? Where's the both sides of it? Where's the alternative viewpoint? Where's all these things that they should be looking into instead of just basically paraphrasing the press releases or re you know rewording the press releases? Where's the analysis of saying, okay, well, this is what they said. What does the other side say? Nobody's, I mean, it's, 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 it's ludicrous, but that's where we're at. We have reached ludicrous speed at this point. Um, we, we just, we're, we're running full steam ahead and God, we've got to get there before the spring revenue forecast comes out because then questions <laughs> might be asked. I God, you know? Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. It's all part of the plan. And the plan is to, is to bulldoze ahead, not, not share information, use the fall revenue forecast numbers. Um, and and get to a pre predetermined outcome. I, you know, again, if I were the administration, I would get the spring revenue forecast numbers out there as soon as I could. Change the nature of the debate because it those numbers will change the nature of the debate. With a press release, it says the legislature no longer has an excuse to avoid the fifty fifty POMV uh, PFD discussion because we're showing you right here how it's going to be paid for. Boom, that's it, and put them out with the spring yeah. revenue forecast. And then, yeah. then leave them twisting. Yeah, and then you know, and 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 hope to hell that Alexi steps up and does the job of, of of analyzing based on those and and looks at the alternatives, or that the press at least gives some credibility to what the administration is saying in terms of Department of Revenue and uh, and OMB when they put out those numbers. Good luck. I mean, the business as usual crowd is in full steam ahead mode right now, and I don't know how we're going to get away from it. Uh, other than keep pointing it out and keep and keep shining the light on it. That's all we can do at this point. Brad, thank you so much for your analysis and for coming on board and being part of it. We appreciate it. And, uh, you know, we look forward to seeing more uh, in the coming weeks. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. I enjoy it. All right. Thanks for coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.